that you be mindful of those who have been listed and of course those that are upon your hearts as we go now to God in prayer our gracious God we come before you this day some with great concerns some with great sorrows some with fear anxiousness we pray this day that you will meet the needs of each of these for those who are angry or hurt we ask your peace to be upon them and bring them relief for those who have known great sorrow May they find in you comfort as you put your arms around them and hold them close. For those who are fearful and anxious, may they find in you the strength they need for this day and all days ahead. We thank you this day because you are so mindful of your children. And all we need do is reach out to you. And you are there to take our hand. We thank you this day. In the name of your Son and of the Holy Spirit, three in one and one in three. Continue with us now as we worship. This we ask in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus the Christ, who taught us to come to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
is Trinity Sunday. It's that Sunday in which we puzzle over the doctrine of God being one in three and three in one. And I know it's a difficult concept. We know we experience God in, in three different ways, and yet in each one of those ways we are experiencing God. So, so we have to, have to kind of struggle with that a little bit, and I know I've struggled with it. I, I've tried very hard to try and find some sort of a, well, way to describe or, or way to experience this, how something can be three and one and one and three. And, and I've tried some of the, the usual recommendations, examples that others give, the, the idea of, well, water. Water can be a solid, it can be a liquid, it can be a gas as water vapor, and yet it can't be all three of those at the same time. Well, that doesn't really work. And, and then there's the example of the egg. You know, an egg is made up of, of a shell and of a yolk and of the white, but the shell can never be the white and and the yolk isn't what you would beat if you were trying to create a, a meringue. So, well, unless, of course, I was the one cooking, and then who knows what I'd use to try and make one. So, but none of those examples work. And finally, I, I just have to admit, I don't have a way of understanding it. I don't have a way of being able to get my mind around that that concept of God, three in one, one in three. But I have found something that, that may help, at least in part, help you and I to understand this nature of God and the nature of us. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 8, and I want to share that with you now. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field the birds of the air, and the fish of the seas, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I think as this poet was looking at the night sky, he saw something that I saw as well some time ago. I was on the rim of the Grand Canyon, which is an amazing thing in and of itself to behold. But it was so dark out there that night 
that I could see the sky in a way that I, I hadn't seen it in a long time. The stars were so bright, and you could actually see the path of the Milky Way that is part of our, our galaxy. And to stand there and, and just see the brightness and the beauty and the reflection of all of those, all of those stars, those planets, it just amazes you. I was, I was standing there in awe. But then I also began to feel a little insignificant. I mean, who, who am I when you're looking at all of this creation? Who am I that God would bother with me? Who, who are any of us that God should be concerned about us? And yet that, that is exactly what the psalmist is telling us and assuring us. I, I wonder sometimes, you know, uh, at the Bible study Wednesday night, Alan raised kind of an interesting image. He was talking about what it will be like when he's standing in front of the throne of God. But I, I'm really kind of concerned about the right now where we stand. And, and, and I wonder, I wonder as... As I lift up my prayers, as I lift up my concerns, if I lift up the, the concerns of others on their behalf, I, I have to wonder, why, why would God, who has created such vastness and such beauty and such wonder, why, why would God take the time to listen to me? And yet, and yet I think that's exactly what the psalmist has discovered is that God takes his greatest pleasure in relating to us, in being with us, in hearing from us. You see, I think that's, that's part of understanding the very nature of God. God is a relationship. God did not create Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The mystery of God is, is God is three in one. God is a relationship of these three ways of being. God is creator. God is Redeemer, and God is our sanctification who comes and guides and, and continues to encourage us. God is all of these things. God is a relationship. And God desires that kind of relationship even, even with us. He didn't create us to just be an additional decoration in, his, in all of the vastness of creation. He created us that he might have a relationship with us. In John, the, the 17th chapter, we hear how Jesus describes this situation. I have made your name known to those whom you gave to me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, 
because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Who are we? Who are we as humans? that God should be mindful of us. We are His. We belong to Him. And His desire is that not only will we be one in Him, but one in one another. We were given a divine spark in our humanity that causes us to long to be with our Creator, but also causes us to recognize the divineness in each other and our desire to be there for each other. Paul wrote that you and I need to be of the mind of Christ. Well, one thing that I do know about the mind of Christ is that his mind was always on the needs of others even when he was surrounded by a crowd of joyous people who were glad that he was coming to their town, one, one desperate woman reached through that crowd, reached through just, just to touch the hem of his garment. She just knew if he, she could just do that. And she does. And Jesus stops the entire crowd for this one woman and he looks at her and he says your faith has made you whole Jesus is going through another town and, and there's this hated cheating tax collector who's climbed up in a tree because no one would ever let him up close to the roadside and lo and behold Jesus, when he gets to that tree, he stops and he looks up at this man and he says to him, come down, I want to go to your house, have a meal with you, let's talk a bit. And Zacchaeus is completely changed. His whole life is changed. His whole attitude towards others is changed because he now has a relationship in this Jesus. He now has a relationship in God. And he recognizes he also has a relationship with everyone else. We are called to be of like mind caring for those around us, looking for the needs of the other and finding ways to be with them, to be in them and they in us. That's, that's part of understanding the very nature of God. Jesus says, you are in me 
I am in you. We are a part of each other. What are human beings? We are marvelous creations. But we are also creations that are given a choice. We are not forced into any relationship. We must choose. We must become aware of our very nature. Of how we are created and what we were created for. And if we don't recognize that, we will fail to understand the relationship that God desires with us. We have a choice. You know, we as human beings are capable of such love and such caring and, and of such beauty. And we are also capable of such anger and hate and destruction. The choice is ours. But it comes from understanding how we were created, why we were created. God in His very nature created us and formed us and saved us and loved us and, and wants to bring us into this relationship. This, this table of communion that we celebrate today. Communion literally means to be in communication with God, to be in relationship with God. God giving Himself to us through these elements, these simple elements of bread and juice, we come into a communal relationship. God in us, us in God. And it's a gift given to us. It's God's grace poured out upon us. That's, that's why we, we don't claim it as our own. This is, this is God's doing, and it's God's gift. We have no claim on it. We have no merit that allows us to say, yes, and we deserve it. But God's grace in His loving, desiring relationship with us provides this means. He wants us to understand that as we take this bread into us, as we take this juice into us, we are entering into an into relationship with God. God in us and us in God. It's a magnificent thing. It's a powerful thing. It's the very thing that should cause you and I to desire and care about our neighbor even as God has cared for us. And so as we come now to this time of sharing this communion, I want you to know and to understand just how much we are loved. Who is humankind that God should be mindful of us? Who are we that God should desire us? We are His children. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we gather before you. We bow down our hearts before you. 
and give you praise. For you, who are a divine relationship, have created us to enter into that relationship with you. Help us to understand, but even more, help us simply to accept, to praise you, and to give thanks, for we are truly blessed. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, 